and Tim will uh, tell us about real-time GPS monitoring of the Cascadia Megathrust. Um, I want to talk about the role that real-time GPS can play in earthquake warning and uh, to describe what we're doing uh, in the Pacific Northwest and how, um, uh, you know, what goes into it, what the network looks like, what the processing looks like, how we can give that information to the seismic networks who can use it in a way that Ronnie just described. Um, it's uh, our group, um, we've been at this for probably 10 years and, and the real reason is not because we were somehow prescient and saw all this coming, but um, back in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s when we were trying to grow the Pacific Northwest Geodetic Array, we were very open to trying to get anybody to try to split the bill to build stations. And it turns out as the technology marched on, and that will be a, a, a theme with this talk, um, real-time, uh, the need of, of, of real-time GPS data for, for professional land surveying actually turned out to be a very early driver. And so in the Panga network, we have probably today two dozen different collaborating agencies, many of whom are just simply focused on providing corrections to surveyors out in the field for very non-scientific applications, you know, finding telephone poles and whatnot. But this got us into the business of computing these real-time corrections to uh, surveyors um, through our partners. And at some point, eight or nine years ago, we thought, well, you know, we're doing this real-time stuff. I mean, why don't, rather than just compute differential corrections, why don't we actually pay attention to what the base stations are doing and see if we can use it for earthquakes, okay? So that's kind of how we got about this, and, um, and I'll show you the results that we have. I'll give you a little motivation, but I want to talk a little bit about our partners because um, we're heavily tied into a, a lot of different groups that are working on this, um, uh, particularly the, the seismic networks and the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. We're feeding them these real-time positions that we're generating now, and we do things a little differently than what Ronnie just described, and I'll talk about that. Um, a lot of the algorithms that we're using, we steal blatantly from Caltech and JPL, so, um, uh, so they're a big partner. Um, we've been doing a lot of systematic comparisons and joint solutions with scripts, um, so they are too. Um, we, we are also downloading a lot of the USGS data and whatnot, and so, uh, so through these partnerships we are able to kind of um, advance what we're doing uh, in terms of taking these stations that have grown up either organically out of the ground over the last 15 years or more top-down, like in the case of the Plate Boundary Observatory, um, and actually put them to use towards seismic and hazards monitoring. And so this, this work is supported by the USGS who funds the, keeping the Panga network alive through the NEHER program, also through the Moore Foundation, um, and that's uh, to, to, it, we're using that money to actually improve how we do our point positioning and get those solutions to the seismic network so that UW can then um, incorporate them through a bunch of algorithms. And then uh, um, it's also supported by NASA, and I wanted to talk about what NASA's role in all of this is. And NASA is not specifically interested in generating an earthquake early warning system per se. The nature of the technical beast that we deal with in trying to do real-time GPS well is that we use global products, and so NASA is funding for instance, our group, the Scripps group, the Reno group, several other groups who have one foot in the earthquake world to do better positioning, but they're also funding um, groups that produce the products that we use, so global uh, orbit uh, corrections, the satellite orbit corrections, the clock corrections. A position is heavily correlated with a clock error, so uh, they're funding groups to, to beat these down, and I think what NASA really wants to see eventually is a circum-Pacific real-time GPS system devised, you know, dedicated towards hazard mitigation. And so they're very interested in funding that, but it's not earthquake early warning. It's more like using all of these thousands of stations that are in the ground towards hazard mitigation, okay? Um, by way of motivation, let me just talk and, and show you this is the poster child of this business. Um, when this earthquake came along, uh, we knew that Japan had the best real-time GPS network on Earth. And that's the co-seismic offsets, okay? So there's five meters. There is a th uh, this shows about 880 stations. Um, and clearly, from the standpoint of utilizing uh, GPS in the world of seismic monitoring, this becomes, obviously, this stuff works. But it only works for the biggest earthquakes. And I think that's clear, but it's a point that needs to be specified again and again and again. You can use GPS all you want, but the day is very, very far away where a GPS will have resolution of sub-millimeter in real time. And so 
the vast majority of earthquakes, roughly six and a half and under, you're not going to see uh, very well with GPS. Okay. Uh, if you look at the time series of that particular earthquake, it becomes a little clearer. Um, this is kind of a complicated plot, but what this on the left-hand side, this is centimeters of offset. So that's essentially 10 meters. The time series are the east-west component of a given GPS station that have been sorted by distance from the hypocenter for the Tohoku earthquake. Okay, so they get as far as 800 kilometers away. That would be this top trace. Okay, and so what you can see is the ones very close in, if I can point properly here, um, you know, the earthquake started at this time on the black line. JMA caught it within two seconds. And then, but big earthquakes take many tens of seconds to get big. They're not, they're not nuclear bombs that go off in a millisecond, right? They take time to evolve. And on top of which you have the, the PNS waves propagating outwards and the surface waves. And so uh, you can see the earthquake actually grow large through this process. And then at this point in time, like Dr. Nakamura referred to, it took about a minute plus to, for the JMA to identify this as a magnitude 8. And at this time, the static offsets are still evolving on the GPS network. And in this area right in here, that's the, the, the gap here, that's that five meters of offset, okay? And so if you do some silly stuff that is not technically sound, but if you just take these time series and you invert for a slip on the fault in real time, um, you get, okay, so this is, the, this is a, pu a pu paper published a couple years ago, the Hayes et al. that showed the evolution of the JMA magnitude, but if you just take the time series from the GPS and invert for slip, after a minute, you've actually grown as big as an 8.5, and after 90 seconds, you're up into the high eights, um, and um, after two minutes, you've reached magnitude nine. Now, the details of this slip distribution are not right. We didn't bias anything. There was no offshore data. It turned out this slip distribution had a lot of very shallow slip. But if you didn't know anything more about this earthquake, but you had 800 real-time GPS stations, and you had a triggering mechanism, you could invert this, and you'd get the magnitude very quickly. Um, so just to show you the instrumentation that's available, so the GeoNet array in Japan is, is it's all high rate, it's all real-time telemetered. Uh, interestingly, one has to buy the data um, because that network was built with a very, s s uh, private surveyors used that data to get real-time corrections just like the dynamics, the, the sort of the market dynamics, if you will, in our world. But if you look at the Cascadia subduction zone, we actually have over 500 GPS stations, every one of which is high rate, meaning it's one second epics, and every one of which is real-time telemetered. Okay, the way that breaks down is about 300 of these stations are Panga, the Pacific Northwest Geodetic Array, um, and then there's about 230 something plate boundary observatory stations, and then there's a bunch of USGS stations that are on volcanoes and whatnot, and then north of the border with Canada, the Canadian uh, they actually built the, the first real-time network in the Pacific Northwest. So all these data are available today. The data is streaming in. Um, 300 stations plus comes to Central Washington University, plus we get some more PBO data and the Canadian data. Uh, all of the PBO data goes to, to uh, UNAVCO. Um, and, and so, so the data is there. So another question is, how are we going to use it? How are we going to use it for seismic monitoring? And by we, I mean the community. We don't do seismic monitoring. That's the PNSN's job. So, but we run the geodetic network. So how can we take this, these measurements and use them and hand it off to the seismic network? That can that that is uh, useful in their way. And so. Let me, uh, I want to say one thing, and this is a philosophy statement, um, which I kind of adopted from listening to the USGS uh, seismologists at the NEIC talk about the NEIC systems. And what they said was, they said, you know, the reason this thing works when it needs to work is because it works all the time. They're constantly locating magnitude sixes off, you know, mid-Atlantic Ridge, south of India, or whatever. And, uh, and so when they really need it to work well in a high profile earthquake, it's always there. And so we've kind of adopted that similar mentality is if you're gonna do this in a way that's robust, uh, we don't, or I don't have the courage to actually believe we can put together, at least at Central Washington University, a triggered based system. I just know something will dump core and it won't work when we really need it to. So our philosophy is you just try to make it work on streams, make it work continuously and all the way and, and keep going. And then the other thing is, you've probably figured out, integrating GPS into routine seismic monitoring, either for 
for typical applications for earthquake early warning is, is tricky, it's challenging. Um, Ronnie has given a nice talk on their algorithm. There's kind of three ways to go about it. Um, one way, and this is what's really being championed by the Scripps group, is to take the real-time GPS and real-time either accelerometer or velocity measurements and integrate them into a single time series that is done through a filter that properly biased, record, gets the high resolution of the accelerometer velocity measurements, which are a million times more sensitive than the GPS, but also recovers the long-term static offsets. The other way is to do kind of what Ronnie described, where you have the GPS and you're looking at, um, uh, you're using the seismic networks to trigger some sort of search or algorithm, that's, that's what Sarah Minson will talk about as well. That's a, that's a second way, and then our way is just to take the GPS alone, that's what we do, and see what you can learn from the GPS and then pass that off to the seismic networks. Um, if you broaden out and look at the West Coast right now, there are 750 real-time high-rate GPS networks coming in across, you know, in the Western states. Um, they're operated by a variety of agencies. There's 350 in California alone. And just if that's not motivation enough, this is a fun little exercise where if you take the USGS slip distribution for the Tohoku earthquake, and we just, all we did was take their slip distribution, flip the subduction zone around, mess with the rake a little bit, and then align the trenches and let it rip off of Cascadia, uh, you get something that looks like that, where you have several tens of meters of offset um, along coastal stations, you have meters of subsidence. And so this is obviously a, this is a, a doomsday earthquake that we don't expect to happen anytime soon, but you get the sense that A, the GPS could contribute in a really big earthquake, and B, uh, the processing algorithm that like Ronnie just described won't work for Cascadia, where you have relative offsets. I think for California transform systems, that's a great way to do it, because assuming you have a strike-slip fault and you've got GPS on either side, relative positions work really well, but when your big fault is on the side and you're up here, it doesn't work as well. So we really feel um, point positioning is the way to go, and I was laughing because when Ronnie showed uh, his, 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 his slide where the top, uh, top left-hand box is the time series production. Essentially, all we do is focused on that box up there, and everything else is handled by the seismic network. Um, so how do we do it? Okay, so what's in a real-time GPS seismic monitoring system? Um, we have found it useful to break this out into the various... Um, levels of data analysis that come in. And in some ways it's similar to a seismic network and in some ways it's very different. Um, a basic level of data, you gotta get your data in from the field. So that's something we worry a lot about. Um, in seismology, you get a stream, if it's a digital network, you get a stream of counts. Where counts are related to typically velocity by some number, that's the gain, if you will, okay? That's the biggest difference. In GPS, what you get is nothing to do with what the position of the ground is. You get something called satellite carrier phase and you get a ranging measurement. Um, that has to be turned into a position estimate through a complicated matrix inversion. So if you think about it, in seismology you get counts, you multiply it times a number, you get velocity. In GPS, you get a bunch of stuff from a bunch of satellites, do a big matrix inversion, and get position, okay? So that's, that's what goes on in this sort of this level one aspect. Um, and then once you get your position estimates, then, okay, then, then you're in business. You can start to do things with, with size, seismic monitoring or whatnot. And so what we call level two, these semantics are essentially things that you would take GPS positions and estimate something, a slip distribution, if you will, or a peak ground displacement or whatnot. Um, and then level three is what you would, uh, how, you, how you actually, the product you would use to integrate that into seismic monitoring. Um, so in our system, uh, essentially what we do is uh, we get the data from all of our network, we grab another hundred stations, and our goal is to ramp this up over the next few years and to point position all 500 Cascadia stations. Um, that obviously is requiring a lot of uh, intellectual and hardware growth. Uh, on our end, but uh, we're working on it. Um, to turn on the point positioning. And then the other thing is I have to say, is when we started out with this system, this didn't exist before. So we kind of had to invent all of this stuff from scratch. And one of the things you gotta do is you gotta come up with a system, okay, you can get your data in from your network and then you can process it into positions, but then you've gotta be able to do something with it. So we ended up building, it turned out a fair chunk of time, of, we call it the aggregator, but it's a big database system that grabs the data the, the process solutions with all their model 
parameters and the variances and also other stuff and redistributes them. And so that, for instance, is the way the PNSN gets the, G the GPS positions from us is through this aggregator system. And then I'll show you this, and if I have time at the end, I'll give you a little demo of um, an actual, just for the Cascadia Megathrust, an actually slip estimator. And once you have slip, you can produce seafloor uplift, and from that you can get tsunami excitation. So you can kind of see how this can be expanded. Uh, and then one of the things that came out real early on was we needed some way to look at this stuff and validate how we're doing. And so there's a very thin client GUI that we've put together. And then most recently, about six months ago, we started actually doing merge solutions with the Scripps, uh, the Scripps Institute solutions. The way they process and estimate their positions, the way we do it is actually very different. And, uh, and so we're now in the business of doing very systematic comparisons of when they're good and we're bad or, the, or vice versa, and then actually merging them together. And this will give you an example of a data. Um, this is one day of data from uh, Cape Blanco. Uh, this is the Pacific Northwest, it's a coastal site, and the, the, red, the, red, the red points are ours. Um, ours and the blue are Scripps's, and we know why ours are fatter um, than the Scripps ones, but well, the way we do things, if there's a cycle slip or something goes on, we know that our, we'll re okay, we recover very fast. Okay? And so the merge solution is the black one, and you can see that. Um, we do some things that are, are deep inside the, G the arcane world of GPS, but essentially uh, um, how we estimate these, the, the various parameters. I want to run through this real quickly. So we do a lot of GPS processing. We, our network runs on 500 CPUs, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing to, to make all of this go. Uh, and then we test everything against uh, Gypsy, which is a JPL product, um, to, to show truth. Okay, um, the database aggregator, it's a big, database that can farm this stuff out, as I mentioned. Um, John's going to kick me out of here, so uh, I want to, I just want to say, and then the last thing we're doing is actually running uh, something, a, a Kalman filter, the network inversion filter, on the actual subduction zone. Uh, and then there's a cockpit to see it all. So what I want to do here is I actually want to, um, I'll show you a live demo of this thing uh, real quickly. This is the actual, um, if I can get it over to show you. <laughs> is it there? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Now I can't see it, but this is the actual thing, and you can cl click on any uh, one of these stations. These are all the stations that are being processed, so we can, uh, we're doing a systematic comparison, so like we can actually take, this is the Bay Bridge right outside here. No. Okay. BRIB? Briona. Oh, really? Briona. Oh. Yeah. Okay, she would know better than me. All right, um, one I know, cheese. That's Tillamook, Oregon. Okay, um, so you can see the, you can see the, uh, uh, these are actually the time series, and then what you can do is you can click through, you can see the instantaneous. Uh, if you watch these things, they'll dance around. Let me, uh, uh, these are the actual, let me crank it up here. So the scale bar up here, that's two centimeters of offset. Um, this is just for 70 stations on the coast that we're doing, um, uh, we, we do about, 50 up in here, and then we're doing some from the Bay Area and some from there just to, to test our solutions against the script solutions. But you can see these things dance around, and they're not, it's not actually moving, this is just uh, uh, the measurement noise that we're beating down. And then a more basic thing you can look at is the, the peak ground displacement. This evolves. And so you imagine if you had 100 of your stations move in some big tectonic event, you can see that. And we're actually toying with trying some way to empirically relate that to uh, essentially magnitude. And then you can actually, here's where it starts to get interesting. This is actually, um, this is not done yet, but it's taking the actual offsets and inverting in real time for slip, okay, and bringing all of this back. So. These are the processes that we're working on right now. Um, this is all open source and it's all readily available. And the key thing is from an earthquake early warning standpoint, it can, the, these products can be formally integrated. By the way, the, the Brendan Crowell and the UW group have a poster out there how they're taking the positions and merging them. But you can imagine if you take the, um, take what this show, where's my mouse, there it is. Take this and, and ramp it up to 500 stations in the Pacific Northwest and another couple hundred more in California, and you're doing all this real time, you suddenly have the, the granularity of offsets that you can actually see co-seismic offsets very quickly and feed those into your algorithms. So, okay. I'm done. <laughs>